Hello there, wonderful people. Welcome back once again. Today, we are out trackside, but we are not in the usual Atlanta sites. No, today we are at CP Bridge. Why are we here, you may ask? Well, the impetus for this journey actually starts from five days ago, when the main man ARP texted me about a rocket train Whoa. that was heading over to NASA. Now, a rocket train is already cooling itself, but do you see that head end? Good evening. Yes, that is Union Pacific 1943, the Armed Forces Special Unit. Wow. So of course, I had to respond to this update in the most appropriate way I knew possible. Anyways, I decided to dig a little deeper about this train and discovered that it was actually coming out of Corrin, Utah, a city that has a very rich rocket history, so much so that they even have a whole rocket garden. And the reason this city has so many ties to space exploration is because it's low key in the middle of nowhere with a lot of open land and space, which means you can have a lot of space to test rockets. And these spatial advantages is why located in Corrin, Utah is facility for Northrop Grumman, a company that is known for manufacturing equipment that is used for space exploration purposes. This time, they were specifically manufacturing boosters for the Artemis II projects from NASA. The first crewed mission among many planned to establish a long-term presence back on the moon. Now, Artemis II is not the actual name of the rocket that will be going up. Instead, the rocket is actually titled the Space Launch System, or the SLS. And the components that Northrop Grumman manufactured that are being moved by this train are the boosters that are located on the side of the rocket that will propel the rocket up into space. Now, you're probably asking, what does this have to do with us? Well, the booster parts are manufactured in Utah, but their intended owner is far away from this city in the middle of nowhere. So, NASA would need the help of the railroad in order to move these parts on a multi-leg journey all the way from Utah to their destination across the country. And the first of these legs was from Corrin, Utah, all the way to Memphis, Tennessee, which is quite the distance. So these rocket booster parts began their journey on the Union Pacific Railroad under the designation UPSCRME, the S for Special, the CR for Corin, and the ME for Memphis. Perhaps you're wondering, why are there boxcars between all of the parts? Well, there are a number of reasons. For one, having extra boxcars spaces out the weight, and it also provides better braking authority, meaning basically they provide more brakes for the train when they need to stop. But a specific incident that really led to the boxcars being used was back in 2007 when one of these trains actually derailed. Oh my God. And don't let this article deceive you. Although it may look from this view that only the locomotives derailed, if you investigate the NASA report, you could see images of the rocket booster components actually on the ground, falling reportedly about 10 feet according to the NASA report due to a trestle breaking upon the train going over it. Now, I couldn't find this within the actual report, but from reading online, it appears that after this incident, it was suggested that boxcars were placed between all of the components to better distribute the weight instead of having it concentrated over a tighter area. Because if you looked at these images, you could see that although there are boxcars, they are not between all of the cars housing the NASA components. And so, that is how we have the train like this today, with power on front and many buffer and spacer cars in between to find braking authority, buffer the slack action of the train, and to distribute the weight. It would take a few days from the initial departure from Corrin, Utah, before this train finally made it all the way to Memphis, Tennessee, where the railroad decided to do the worst thing that they could have done for anyone who wanted to see this train south of Memphis, and they took off the what? Union Pacific no, power. Dude! Don't even ask me why, because when they ran a train like this a few years ago, that power stuck on the train the whole journey. I. I don't know why they decided to do this. This was definitely a tragic update to hear until news came out that they had instead replaced UP 1943 with Norfolk Southern 6920, Incredible. the veterans unit, a unit that I didn't even know was allowed to go out of local service. And now here it is leading this very high profile train on its next leg of his journey from Memphis, Tennessee, all the way to Jacksonville, Florida, 
under the designation Norfolk Southern 056. So with Union Pacific now handing over the loads to Norfolk Southern, everyone in the area was in anticipation for this train, waiting for updates as to when it was gonna leave. And on a Sunday afternoon, reports were finally coming in that it was very close by. And so with Mama Bear with me, we took the journey over to CP Bridge, where our arrival here would be interrupted by the passing of Norfolk Southern 371 heading into the north end of Indian Yard. Right after this train cleared, we parked, and the gates immediately went down as soon as I got out. And honestly, what I thought was a railroad crossing malfunction turned out to be another train. Nice. It's Norfolk Southern 218, northbound empty auto racks coming by with a very friendly crew on the head end. And now being settled down, we can take a good view as to how many people are out here. Today was a very beautiful day, and with it being a weekend and with the NASA train coming, almost everyone that I knew who was into trains was out waiting for this train to come by. With the on rack train cleared, there was now a lot of unexpected waiting. You see, I had honestly rushed out here because someone had told me that this train was passing Austell. A passing that is so iconic that now if you go into the Austell rail cam, they literally have this rocket train as the thumbnail to the cam. And with it having already passed Austell, I thought that it was going to be coming by very soon. Until I heard that it had stopped. Bruh. And unfortunately for me, there was nothing much else going on. Because right before I had come here, this BNSF coal train had come by with a very nice set of EMD power on the fronts. And there was another coal train with not one, but two executive max on it that never came. So I was just sitting here waiting. The only thing of interest that happened in the entire time of me being out here was the fact that the railroad crossings from once did actually malfunction. They went down with no train coming and a van lost in indecision, backed out of trying to run the gates and ended up getting bonked on top by one of the railroad grates. Eventually, with a little bit more waiting, the rocket train got a crew and they started to depart Mableton. And it wasn't long after this departure that the headlights came over the bridge off in the distance and finally, the desired train that everyone had come out for came by with a large crowd of spectators watching in eager anticipation. Also, for any railroad enthusiasts who are watching this video, yes, that is the CMQ unit. The one that I was practically stalking last week that literally just spawned here while I was waiting for this rocket train to come by. What a nice surprise. Anyways, for this being a high profile train, I heard that it was notoriously slow. Like very, 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 very slow. And had a number of scheduling issues. Scheduling issues that are perfectly encapsulated by fellow rail buddy Chase Gibson who had come out much farther south waiting for this train. Now, seeing that this train had come by in sunlight 
and that this road was at least four hours from Atlanta. I know that he knew better than to think that he was actually gonna see this train in daylight. As you can see by his video, sunlight would quickly evaporate with no rail activity happening. And when rail activity did start happening, it was a bunch of other Norfolk Southern trains. It would be hours after this man made it trackside before this train even reached Cordell, Georgia, which was still hours away from where this man was. And look at the time that this train cleared Cordell, Georgia. It took this train about eight hours to get from Atlanta, Georgia to Cordell, Georgia. And let me just tell you, Cordell is not eight hours from Atlanta. This thing, this thing was just taking a very long time. And so it would be more waiting with more regular trains and a lot of silence before finally at almost 5 a.m. This train cleared this man. And lo and behold, look what happened to this bro. Hey, Chase, you and me both, bro. I understand the pain of having your videographic documentation apparatus fumble right when you're trying to see something. Though I will admit that mine was just two regular CSX trains. You, I want to legit shed tears if this happened to me. And good thing that you could chase, because if I were you, I would too. And so Chase, living up to his name, chased this train for a few hours, getting whatever shots he could of this train as it was racing through the night towards his destination of Jacksonville, Florida. Y'all, look at how much time this man spent looking for this train. God bless your soul, bro. And the craziest thing is, is that even with how long this train took to get from Atlanta to Jacksonville, this wasn't even the end of its journey. What? For those of you who know about the NASA facility, the NASA facility in Florida is located at Cape Canaveral, which is not in Jacksonville. So this train had to take the third and final leg of its journey from Jacksonville, Florida to Titusville, Florida, where Florida East Coast train 121 would take these loads to be dropped off at NASA's JJ Yard. And once reaching JJ Yard, these loads would then be handed over to NASA, where NASA would then take these trains over the infamous JJ Railroad Bridge to the Kennedy Space Center, where the boosters will finally be assembled and attached to the SLS in preparation for the ultimate launch date of the Artemis II mission to the moon. It's been a long journey for these boosters, going all the way from nowhere in Corrin, Utah, to Memphis, Tennessee, to Jacksonville, Florida, and now finally to the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral, and then ultimately to the moon. Crazy how far these things have traveled and crazy how long it took for these things to travel. But ultimately, these things were able to make it safely and are now currently undergoing work for the eventual mission. And honestly, I'm glad that I was even able to see this train, even if it was just for a glimpse, so I could capture a part of this journey and share with you all. I'll include links to some of the resources, the held information that I saved inside this video. And huge shout out to Otto the Rail Fan, Chase Gibson, and Train64 for giving me footage of the other parts of this journey that I would not have been able to film given that it was in different parts of the country. Especially you, Train 64. Oh my goodness, I was begging for FEC footage and you were the one person who said yes. Thank you so much. Make sure to give those three a sub and check them out. Anyways, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. And as always, God bless. I will see you soon out on the high island.